Hello again, Eternal Faith family. Um, we are back together again electronically um, to continue our study of the book of Colossians. Um, we're going to be moving into uh, the, the kind of middle section of the book, um, uh, and uh, we're going to be reviewing a little bit of what we talked about last week and, and kind of leading that into a discussion that we're going to have today um, about Paul's ministry um, and uh, I, uh, before we get started with that, I would like to say a, a brief word of prayer, so if you'll please join me in that. Dear Lord, we do thank you for today. God, we thank you for giving us this opportunity, Lord, to meet together in an unconventional way, um, but, but a way that, that we can still continue to grow in our knowledge and understanding of you and your word. God, I pray that you would lead us and guide us with your spirit, Lord. God, I pray that you would help us to better understand um, your son and, and what he has done. Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow closer to you, um, that we may walk humbly um, with our God. And God, I, I pray that you would bless this time, uh, bless our minds, bless our hearts, so that we may grow in you. Lord, I pray that in this time that you would give us clarity of mind, um, Lord, that you would give us a focused mind. Lord, we thank you again for this opportunity. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We now begin to move on um, from last week's discussion in which Paul introduced himself to the church in Colossae and uh, he encouraged them in a time of, of pr social pressure and difficulty. Um, and as well as Paul's addressing of the um, diminished view of Christ uh, that was beginning to kind of become a problem in the Colossian church. Um, and, and if you will recall, I mentioned last week a little bit about what, what, what people call the Colossian heresy. Um, there's a handful of different aspects to this heresy. Um, it, it, was, it was some false teaching within the church um, that Paul wrote this letter to address. And one of the things that they, that they did was that they had a very diminished view of who Christ was, that, that they kind of um, devalued a lot of who Christ was. And Paul addresses this um, fairly quickly. Um, and, and now he moves from a discussion of Christ and the supremacy of Christ um, to his own personal ministry, beginning uh, in chapter 1, verse 24 and following. Um, and so now that we've established um, these that, that, that Christ is um, the, the many things that he lists out here, he's the firstborn of creation, the first fruits of the resurrection, the, the image of the invisible God, one with, um, with the Father and uh, our redemption, Christ, uh, Paul now moves on to understand his own labors in the church, and he understands them in light of Christ. And so, uh, now, beginning in chapter 1, verse 24, and following to the end of chapter 1. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I will strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So Paul now begins to reflect a little bit on his own ministry uh, in this letter. And so uh, beginning in verse 24, he talks about a little bit about his suffering. Now, if you recall from last week, um, I made mention of the fact that Colossians was written while Paul was in prison. And so Colossians being one of the prison letters of Paul, um, he, he, he has on his mind his current situation. Um, and he 
understands that he is in prison for preaching the resurrection of Christ. And he says that he rejoices in his sufferings. That he rejoices in what he suffers for you. He's referring here to the church in in Colossae. And not only does he point out that he rejoices in this suffering, but the reason for why he rejoices in this suffering is because he understands it as a service for the church. That it, that it is a Christ-given commission, or a God-given commission, to serve God's body or the church. And so Paul can understand his suffering and be joyful in it because he understands that it is kind of his way of sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Um, and in the same way that Christ suffers, uh, suffered for, for, for his church and for his people, Paul likewise suffers with Christ. Now, um, not, not only this, um, but Paul discusses what it is that he suffers for, or rather what his mission is. Uh, so, for example, in verse 25, he says, I've become a, a servant by the commission of God, gave me to present to the uh, present you the word of God in its fullness. So Paul is imprisoned because he is preaching the word. And more specifically, he now mentions the mystery. Uh, now, the mystery of, of Christ is, is an interesting idea. Um, he mentions it here in verse 26. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Um, And the mystery is Christ. Um, Christ was the mystery. um, That that God had a plan for redemption, that God had a Messiah um, that would come and save. Now that part wasn't a mystery, but Christ was a mystery. Christ was the Messiah. He was uh, the king for uh, the, the people of Israel. But even more importantly, he was ultimately their savior um, and redeemer. And not only, Paul makes very quick mention, not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. And this was a mystery that was kept hidden, as Paul says in, in these verses. And it's important to, to remember, the Colossians, although there are many Jews in the church in Colossae, the, primarily the people there would have been Gentiles. And so Paul makes quick mention that that Christ was a mystery for for many, many reasons, but one of them being that Christ was not just the Savior of the Jews, but rather that Gentiles would also be included in the Lord's people, um, as he says in verses 26 and 27. Um, And finally, Paul mentions in verses 28 and 29, very, very interestingly, He actually kind of begins to mention here in the beginning of chapter 2 that we'll read in just a moment um, what his mission actually is. Um, So follow follow along in in verse 28. He says, He is the one that we proclaim, in reference to Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I will strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Now, Paul did many, 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 many things in his ministry. Paul did many, many things in his ministry. He went um, to pagan cities and preached the resurrection. Paul debated and argued with the Sanhedrin. Paul uh, preached the, the gospel to Roman officials and Roman citizens. Paul uh, aided in church ministry between different churches in vast areas. But Paul makes the point here that one the, the part of the, the the goal that he has, or, or as he puts it, to this end, and that is what? To admonish and teach everyone with wisdom so that they may be presented fully mature in Christ. Paul understood his church ministry's goal was to teach and admonish the people in the church so that they may grow in their maturity in Christ. That was Paul's goal. 
That was what he raised the church up to do, and that's what he raised them up to be. That, that he taught them so that they could grow in their maturity with Christ. Now, that is the goal of all church ministry, by the way. Um, that the, part of the purpose of church ministry um, is to grow the individual believers. Now, obviously that takes its form in many different ways, right? Because as the people in the church grow, they will do different things in the community, in the church, and for people. But that all comes about because those people have, been, have become mature in Christ. And so that's the pur- that is the purpose of Paul's ministry. It is to teach and grow the people in the church so that the people in the church can be mature in Christ and create effective change in their communities, in other people's lives, that the church itself can thrive because the church is full of mature believers. That's the, that is what Paul says is the end to his ministry here in verses 28 and 29. He continues now on in chapter 2 to continue to talk about, for the first five verses, more about his ministry. He says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those in Laodicea, and for all of those who have not met me personally. My goal, again, the phrase, my goal or my end, is that they may be encouraged in, in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Now, Paul begins to... I would argue, quite brilliantly, argue against one of the the parts of the Colossian heresy, and he kind of seamlessly glides his way into this discussion from what we were just talking about. Now, Paul's mission, as he just claimed, was to grow the church through his teaching and in their understanding so that they may become mature in Christ. And now Paul transitions that and says, I'm going to continue to teach you and others Um, I encourage your growth. Why? He he says it right here. Why does he say that he's going to continue to grow their knowledge and understanding? Well, it's so that they may not be led astray. He says it in in verse 4. I tell you this, why? So that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Now, this is important. Paul has established now that he intends to teach and encourage so that the church may be united in love, so that they may know and understand the, 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 the riches that come about from knowing Christ. And he does this, why? So that they wouldn't be deceived or so that they would not be led astray by fine-sounding arguments. Now, it's important to take a step back now and review a little bit of the background that I mentioned last week. Remember that Colossae was a town that had a lot of pagan influence, a lot of pagan influence, which was fairly normal for many of the the early churches faced this. And one of the things that are included in pagan influences, along with pagan religion, like the, the Roman gods and goddesses or the Greek gods and goddesses, Um, was a a lot of philosophy. Now, I use that term as a a blanket term here. Um, They're they're known for anything. It's their theology and their their philosophy um, and their their architecture. And and the Greeks had a lot of philosophies. Um, uh, As a matter of fact, it's basically impossible to study philosophy without studying the Greek philosophers. Um, they had a lot of ideas about a lot of different things. Um, and Paul, even back then, 
was exposed to a lot of this. Now, we know this from the book of Acts. There's numerous occasions where, where Paul discusses philosophy, even Greek philosophy, with Greek philosophers. Paul was very well, very well educated in this. Um, he knew the ins and outs of Stoicism and, and, and Epicureanism and, and a form of Platonism. Um, he was familiar with these ideas. And so Paul, writing to the church in Colossae, is aware that that's the world that they live in. That they are exposed to these kind of ideas. Now, um, uh, not, to, not to, to get into the specifics of all these different philosophies, but just to understand that there's a lot of social pressure from the Gentiles in Colossae on the church. Um, and that apparently, and, and we don't know because it's not explicitly said, but that much of the, the critical teachings in the church were becoming compromised by these people in the town that were kind of stealing away members of the church with, as he puts it, fine-sounding arguments. Um, now, I would argue that they probably were not fine arguments, but that they were fine-sounding arguments, right? That they sounded good. Not necessarily that they were good, but just that they sounded really nice. Um, and so Paul men mentions his ministry in teaching and understanding and knowledge in the church. Why? Because he understands that what the church in Colossae is fighting is a battle of ideas. That the people in that church are being led astray in what they think. And so Paul intends to guard them and guard their minds in this way. And so what do we do? Well, Paul begins in chapter 2, verse 6 and following to address the two primary pressures of ideas in, in, in the minds of the church in Colossae. Uh, the first was what I just mentioned with the pagan and Greek philosophy. Um, and uh, its, its applications uh, to steal away members of the church. Uh, but the other one was a form of Judaism that was very um, set on following the Old Testament law. So a lot of these new believers in the church in Colossae had one of these two backgrounds. They knew Greek philosophy very well or Greek, Greek pagan gods, or they were very familiar with Ju Judaism and the following of the Torah. And so Paul's going to address these two ideas, and the remainder of chapter 2 is, is a discussion of these two ideas, and they're kind of interwoven, so we'll talk about them as they, as they come. Beginning in verse 6 of chapter 2, so then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, he begins by saying, where do you build your foundation? In Christ. As Paul began the letter with Christ and a high view of Christ, and how he's now discussed that what he taught them was the mystery, which is Christ, to hold on to Christ, so that whatever all of these ideas come about, that what you will hold on to is Christ. He continues now. See to it that no one takes you captive, through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. In other words, don't build your philosophy or your world on anything but Christ. And he now gives a reason for why that is. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So why is it that you begin with Christ? Well, because... Christ, as he puts it, in Christ, the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. In other words, because Christ is God. Not only that, 
But it is because of Christ that you have been brought to what? Fullness. And because every power and every authority is under whom? Christ, as he established earlier in the letter. So it is Christ that upholds everything and is the ruler of everything. Now, for a Greek mind, that's a little bit weird. Because remember, for the Greeks, they had like a god, but they had a sphere. So for example, there was a god of, um, there was a god for music. There was a god for wealth. There was a god for agriculture. There was a god for uh, sex. There was a god for lightning. There was a god for beauty. There was a god for hunting. There, was, there were gods, but they had their sphere. And, and that, was, that was the limit of their authority, was their sphere. And Paul makes mention here that it is Christ that is the head over every power and authority. In other words, he shatters this Greek idea of these very limited spheres of influence and power by these deities and says, no, 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 Christ is the authority. That every other power and authority submits to. And so after, after taking a stab at, the, at the, the Greek philosophy, he now moves on to Jewish thought, and he starts talking about circumcision. Now, uh, whenever we were going through the book of Romans with the uh, book of Acts and the book of Romans with the youth, uh, I told them, always understand circumcision in light of Old Testament law and covenant, um, because that's the idea that's there. So if so if you're ever reading Scripture and you're like, I really don't understand what Paul is trying to say here, understand that what he's talking about is covenant and law. Whenever he's talking about circumcision, he's talking about the covenants and the law. What does Paul say in regards to these? He says, in him, in who? Christ. You were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self was ruled by, your whole self ruled by flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. What is that circumcision in Christ? Great question. He answers it. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. In other words, your circumcision of the flesh is your baptism. In other words, your death to your, death to your flesh, your fleshly desires and your resurrection to a new life. Um, now, it is important to note that body and flesh in the New Testament are not the same thing. And it is very important that you understand that or else you'll end up uh, uh, heretical, basically, um, which was actually a, a problem in, in the second century church. Um, it was the idea of Gnosticism. Uh, there are different words in English. There are different words in Greek. Um, uh, a, s the, the flesh is a reference to your sinful nature, your sinful human nature. That's what the flesh is. Your body is this thing, like your physical body. Um, it's important to understand that because there's nothing wrong with this thing. Having a physical body is, is not bad. Your flesh, or your sinful nature, your fleshly desires, those are the problem. And so Paul is saying that through your baptism, symbolically, you have died to your fleshly desires and been raised to new life with Christ. In other words, you don't have to be physically circumcised because through spiritual... Through, through baptism, you have already died to your flesh. And so Paul is, now, Paul is now talking in the language of the Jew. And now he moves on. When you, were ra when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood, against, uh, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it 
all away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now he points out that not only is it brilliantly, not only is it that Christ is the one who, is, uh, who, who satisfies the circumcision of your flesh, right? That, that all of our sinful nature and all of our sin and all of the indebtedness that we have as a result of that is nailed to the cross. Not only does he do that, but then he says, in the face of whom? The powers and authorities that, that, that he triumphs over. So in this, Paul points to the cross as an answer not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. To understand that, that it is the cross that makes all things right with God, which helps the Jew to understand, but also the pagan to understand that this, that this God, for, for the, that Christ, this God of the Christian religion, can triumph over his enemies in death. And so Paul has now, now taken Christ and his death and his resurrection and applied it to the Greek and Jewish thought of the time. And he moves on now to talk about how this gives us freedom from, from the, the, the many rules and regulations that were there before. So he now says in verse 16, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or in regards to religious festivals, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Um, so Paul here is directly talking about um, Jewish rituals, uh, the, the dietary laws or the observing of the Sabbath or um, the observing of Jewish uh, holidays, and he says that is not what you should be judged by. The following of these rituals. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions in their in spiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows in, as God causes it to grow. Now there's a lot there. Um, to begin with, uh, he makes mention of this weird passage where he talks about uh, the worship of angels. Uh, we're not entirely sure what that was or what that looks like. Um, but apparently the Colossian church had a, had a problem with some people worshiping angels. Um, now Paul says on numerous occasions, actually in the new Testament, um, to, that, that, that angels don't need to be worshiped. I'm as a matter of fact, angels say that on numerous occasions in scripture. Um, every time anybody bows to an angel, they say, no, 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 please don't do that. Um. And so, Paul makes mention here that, that <laughs> I like how he calls it a false humility. Um, the people that worship angels, uh, apparently they claimed to have visions and had seen things, uh, as he says. Um, and Paul says that, that they are, that they are uh, puffed up, that they're, they're prideful in it. Um, and he calls it a false humility. He calls them prideful. And uh, he calls them, ultimately, he, he calls them uh, that, they have, that they have become uh, cut off, or, or he says that they've lost connection with the head, that is Christ, uh, the head of the body. And so Paul claims that those who are the worshipers of, of angels, um, that don't, don't be caught up with that. They have a false humility. They're just prideful. They, they're just, they're puffing themselves up. Um, it reminds me of in, in, Second, Colo in Second Corinthians, 
Paul makes mention of, of his visions of heaven. And, um, and he says that, 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 that God gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble about it. Um, whereas these guys apparently either had seen visions and were very prideful about it, or uh, just claimed to have seen visions and were very prideful in it. And so Paul encourages them to not have anything to do with those people. Now there's a lesson there to be learned, um, that if someone is very prideful in the things that they have done or seen um, to the point where it's a problem, probably shouldn't listen to them. Um, the, the, the scriptures have many, many things to say about the prideful, and they're not very good. Um, another thing to keep in mind here uh, is that who is it that causes growth in the body? God. God. Now, I think that there could be an application here to the body as in the church, Christ as the head, and the body growing, or the church growing, as God causes it to grow. And now moving on to this last section here, verses 20 and following. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belonged to the world, do you submit to these rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom and their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Now, Paul makes a very interesting observation and insight here. That is, that the having or the observing of rules does not necessarily mean that there is any value to it. We, saw that, we, we see this case in point like the Old Testament. How many times does God say, stop bringing me sacrifices? They don't mean anything. And so, Paul here concludes this section here. After establishing that it is in Christ that you must place your mind and your thoughts, um, that, that the goal of church ministry is to bring people into maturity in Christ, so that they may become powerful, powerful believers. And Paul addresses uh, some of the issues and pressures in the church. The worship of angels, the observance of all of the Jewish practices, the um, clinging to Greek and, and pagan philosophies. And Paul says, look, following those rules just to follow those rules doesn't mean anything. Um, And there's not too much more about it here in Colossians. There is some. um, And we'll talk a little bit about about that next week. But but really, Paul hits on this idea in Galatians. that, That following the law just to follow the law doesn't mean anything. And 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 instead we should live by the Spirit. And, and if you live by the Spirit, Paul would say, you don't even have to worry about following the laws. Because if you can live by the Spirit, the law is nothing. And the law is, the law is like surface level, like level one easy if you can actually live by the Spirit. And so Paul makes the point here that there were many people in the church that had many issues. And Paul is saying, for, for those of you who are faithful, don't have anything to do with people that are worshiping angels and, and, and in pride, puffing themselves up. Don't have anything to do with those people that are trying to lead you astray with Greek philosophy or with Jewish tradition and, and following the Torah. But rather, as he says, see to it, in verse 8 of chapter 2, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, decept- through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, 
and on the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And so Paul says, if you want to, to remain faithful and, and, and hey, church in Colossae, here's what you do. When this happens, when, 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 when you face all these pressures and when there's all this confusion, Start with Christ and, and teach and grow in your understanding of Christ and the things of Christ so that, so that when all of this mess comes about, your mind will not be led astray. Now, does that mean that studying these sort of things is bad? No. Again, I say Paul studied these things. Paul knew Greek philosophy. Paul knew <laughs> Paul knew Jewish tradition. But guard your mind with Christ so that you may not be deceived. Paul will say Paul, Paul will say elsewhere, do not be swayed as as a ship is by waves. And so next week we're going to talk about well all right Paul if I don't have to live by these rules, if I don't have to live by these Jewish traditions and I don't have to worry about all this because, hey, Christ has, you know, um, as, as Paul pointed out, that, that our sin and, and all and our flesh has been nailed to the cross. What does that mean now? Do I get to do whatever I want? Um, well, we'll talk about that next week. Um, the answer is no. Um, just a little bit of a, of, of a spoiler alert there. Uh, um, you can't, um, but, but we'll talk a little bit about why next week. Um, and so I do hope that you will join us next week, uh, and I do hope you've, you've learned something today. Uh, I ask you now to please bow your head in prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you for today. God, I thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to study your word, to learn a little bit, God, about what um, Paul was writing to the Colossians and why. God, I pray that you would help us to, to better understand, um, Lord, that, that, that it is nothing new that the church has faced many, many problems in the world of ideas. Lord, that the things of Christ have been under attack for millennia. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand, Lord, that, that it is because we can build our minds around Christ that we can endure that, and that the church has endured that. God, I pray that you would help us to continue to grow in our understanding of you and the things of you so that we may not be led astray by our times or, or, or situations. God, I pray a uh, thanks for your faithfulness to us all. Lord, I pray that you would help us this week, that we would build our, our minds on you. And God, I pray that you would continue to lead, guide, and direct us with your spirit. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Hey everyone, we'd like to start by thanking you for being here with us today. We're so glad you decided to join us in our worship today. For more information about us, visit our website at www.eternalfaith.org. If you have questions, please give us a call at 512-272-4043 or drop us an email at office at eternalfaith.org. Looking to make a donation? you can give to Eternal Faith in several ways. On the church website at www.eternalfaith.org and then just click on Give in the menu bar, the Secure Give app on your phone, or you can always send it via U.S. mail to Eternal Faith Baptist Church, 12720 FM 973, Maynard, Texas 78653. Please join us Sundays at 10 a.m. for our live stream. Can't make it to the live stream? No problem. You can watch online anytime. Just go to the website at www.eternalfaith.org and click on Watch Sermons in the menu bar. If you have any questions, please feel free to give us a call or send us an email. Or better yet, join us in person. Please feel free to watch our other videos. Our latest video is below and to the left, and our playlist is below and to the right. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can subscribe 
by hitting the EF logo in the center or hitting the subscribe icon below this video.